Okay, last topic I wanted to cover today. We talked about the ProPublica piece around Justice Alito, and there were two parts to that. The first was that Justice Alito um, did not disclose that he had accepted a private plane flight from a guy named Paul Singer. They went on some sort of Alaskan fishing trip together. And the second is that he didn't recuse himself from a case that sort of tangentially involved Paul Singer, although Paul Singer was not listed uh, as a party to the case or in any of the conflicts things. And David, we got a lot of feedback on this. And I just want to revisit it for a second because I'm going to put the feedback in a few buckets here. The first bucket is, you guys are bending yourselves in pretzels to defend Alito because he's conservative. You would never do this for Kagan and Sotomayor. Do you know how I know that's false? Because we've literally done it for Kagan and Sotomayor. So if you're new to the podcast, <laughs> and by new, I mean like you've only listened to one episode, I will revisit the Kagan and Sotomayor issues. So uh, Justice Sotomayor was paid $3 million since 2010 by Penguin Random House. They then had multiple cases in front of the Supreme Court where she did not recuse herself. I highly disfavor recusals. You can play a lot of games with it. Um, and when you're talking about only nine people, uh, those games can really then mess with the court. Um, now, why did I not think she should recuse herself when she's getting $3 million? Oh my God. Well, because that was contractually owed to her. The outcome of the case did not affect her financial interest. That's why I didn't think she should have to recuse herself. Uh, Justice Kagan, for instance, taught at Harvard. They paid her money for that. She did not recuse herself from the Harvard affirmative action case. Same exact thing, nor should she have. That was money owed to her under a contractual obligation. The outcome of the Harvard case makes no difference to whether she has paid that money. She doesn't have a fiduciary interest in the out or, uh, financial interest in the outcome of the case. So the idea that I wouldn't defend liberal justices doing this. Um, yep, you're falling on deaf ears with me there. David, any thoughts on that? So, yeah, so this is sort of generally, okay, once you get into objectively, did Alito violate court ethics? And if the answer is he did not, then you're in subjective land, which is how icky is this? How, what are, you know... <laughs> Sort of how do you feel about it? And and this is where I have some disagreements with some of the allies of Alito and Thomas, et cetera, and disagreements with some of their most severe critics. Look, on their most severe critics, if they're not violating the rules of ethics, then your real beef is with the rules of ethics here. Um, which have been so, changed. Which have been changed. Now, where I am departing from the most zealous defenders of Alito and Thomas is, I still don't like a lot of the underlying practices, which guess what? It's one of the reasons why the rules were changed. In fact, I'm maybe I could say I'm so right that the previous rules were wrong, that the proof in the, is in the pudding that these rules were changed, that it created a problem. It was inherently a problem that required a solution and we have this solution. So it is not unfair to say, hey, I saw that as a problem. And guess who agreed with me? The court, because it changed the rules. <laughs> yeah, I'll put this in bucket number two, uh, which we've called the ick factor. David Latt has sort of sided with us on this in his um, newsletter, uh, uh, Original Jurisdiction. Um, I want to put a little more beef behind the ick factor, though. Yeah. Which is this. <laughs> One of Justice Alito's defenses is that he didn't even know who Paul Singer was. This, you know, like dude he barely knows offers him a seat on his private jet out to this fishing trip. <laughs> okay, why, why is someone you don't know offering you a seat on their private jet? Because you're a Supreme Court justice, maybe? <laughs> like, that's, you know, that's very different than the Harlan Crow thing where they're longtime friends. I don't know that that's the defense he thinks it is. Now, David, to your point about disagreeing with the most strident critics, this idea that he was trying to hide it from disclosures. 
Nope. He talked about it in interviews before. There were other judges on the trip who did disclose it because lower court judges have different ethical rules. So like the trip was well known. That's how ProPublica found out about it. If he was trying to hide it, he didn't do a very good job talking about it publicly in interviews with David Latt, for instance. Um, okay. So I, I got this idea, though, from a very smart lawyer. And I wanted to run this by you, David. He's got a few okay. solutions here. One, he agrees these guys didn't do anything impeachable. And therefore, like, there's nothing to particularly do here. The beef is with the code of ethics. He says, clearly, the judicial code of ethics needs teeth. It needs enforceability. How about prohibit gifts beyond a certain yearly amount, $100, no exceptions except from close relatives? Um, that's number one. Two, what about a disciplinary board like there are for all other jurists, state and federal uh, judges, perhaps a heightened majority needed to sanction to ensure no ideology plays a role, but some enforceability aspect to it. So increase the rules, increase the enforceability. And then this is the one, though, David, like I'm pretty sure, whatever, I, I guess I don't care that much about that part of it. Um, I think by and large, the court is actually OK on this. But here's the one that I really like. I disfavor recusals because you have only nine people. You can play games with it. You can add on potential uh, plaintiffs. You can add on potential lawyers, all just to get a judge that you don't want recused off a case. That should be disfavored. His idea. Uh, that if a justice is recused from a case, first of all, yep, more recusals. And when a justice is recused from a case, there is a random drawing of a chief judge from one of the circuits to sit by designation for that case. Love that idea. Interesting. Because it also means that, you know, part of, I think the complaint is you think these people aren't recusing because it means they'll lose one vote for their team. I don't think that. I think it's because overall recusals are disfavored, like I said, because the mm -hmm. people bringing the case can play games, not the people hearing the case. Right. But regardless, this does fix that problem. Now, it's not going to fix it for everyone because the circuit courts aren't created equal. The chief judges aren't created equal. But chief judges at the circuit court level are picked from the most senior judge on that circuit. So it won't be that, well, the Fifth Circuit's really crazy conservative, so that's always going to be a conservative. Nope, it's going to be whoever's the, basically been on that court the longest. And it'll be randomly drawn from all of the chief judges. So there's sort of a double randomness aspect to that. Um, I don't know. I really like that solution. Yeah, I'd like, I, that's very intriguing. I like that solution. That's some good creative thinking there. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I still disagree with people who think, you know, we got a lot of, of course, Alito knew Paul Singer was involved in this case. It's like saying you don't know that Mark Zuckerberg is involved in Facebook. Mm. A, I disagree. But B, yeah, that's no, it's not just the justice. The justice isn't going to see this case until the very end of the train tracks. You're talking about court personnel who actually put together, like match up the um, interest list with the recusal list. Then you're talking about clerks. So a bunch of 26 year olds to 28 year olds, maybe 30 year olds who are going to need to know it. Then it finally gets to the end of the line and a justice sees it. And like, OK, so you think the Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk examples are easy. <laughs> what about all of the other people out there in the world who have some, you know, hedge fund or interest and you've seen them at a thing or whatever? Um, this idea that you're going to know the name of every organization that they're involved in that's not listed on the financial interest list that is matched up with the conflicts and the recusal list. Sorry then make that conflicts list more inclusive. Your problem is with the rules, not with everyone should already know this, which is just not a standard I think is even like, it doesn't pass the laugh test for me. Yeah, yeah.